We bring attention to some of these films now in order to address the broader issue of representation in popular culture and to start a conversation about the way America sees itself. This is 100 Years of Whitewashing in Film. Whitewashing, as it refers to filmmaking, is the practice of casting white actors in non-white roles. It can also signify the preferential hiring of white actors, directors, cinematographers, and so on over equally qualified people of color. a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream to do. Nineteen fifteen, Birth of a Nation, directed by D. W. Griffith based on a novel by Thomas Dixon, Jr. Famous for its pioneering camera techniques, many have credited Birth of a Nation as having saved American cinema. But the film is more commonly infamous for its use of blackface and a narrative that emboldened and arguably revived the KKK. White actors play psychopathic, sexually aggressive black characters, and where there are actual African Americans cast in the film, they are extras that deliberately make no physical contact with their white co-stars. The NAACP boycotted Nation's release. Riots over the film broke out in Boston and Philadelphia, and it was altogether banned from movie theaters in Chicago, Denver, Kansas City, Missouri, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. In spite of all this, the film would be the first American motion picture screened in the White House for the viewing pleasure of President Woodrow Wilson, friend of the screenwriter. And in 1992, the Library of Congress would preserve Birth of a Nation in the National Film Registry. Its history looms large, and for better or worse, it is still taught in schools to this day. 1937, The Good Earth, directed by Sidney Franklin, Sam Wood, Gustave Maketi, screenplay by Talbot Jennings, Tess Schlesinger, and Claudine West. Based on Pearl S. Buck's Pulitzer Prize winning novel of the same name, The Good Earth stars white actors Paul Muni and Louise Rayner as Chinese farmers Wang and Olan. Buck, having grown up in China, was excited at the prospect of her work being made into a movie for American audiences and wanted to cast all Chinese or all Chinese American actors, but was ultimately given no control over the picture and producers chose an all-white cast, apart from some Chinese-American extras. Though American Chinese actresses like Anna Mae Wong were seriously considered for leading roles, when Paul Muni was given the male lead, the Hayes Coes impacted further casting of the film due to anti-miscegenation laws preventing on-screen mixed-race couples, even those using yellowface to appear Chinese. Making three and a half million dollars at the box office, The Good Earth would win the Academy Award for Best Actress and Best Cinematography, and was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Film Editing. Regardless of these allocates, Asian American audiences and many others would be uncomfortable watching this film today. Casting white actors, even though Chinese actors were available, should raise suspicions, especially when producers suggest Americans weren't ready for a Chinese-led movie. 1954, Apache, directed by Robert Aldrich, screenplay by James R. Webb. Known for his previous role as Native American Jim Thorpe in the biopic All-American, Burt Lancaster was chosen as a lead in the sympathetic story of an Apache warrior still fighting for his freedom in the American antebellum West. Lancaster's character, Ma Sai and Jean Peters Nalen, are characterized by their brutish behavior and poor diction. 
all the hallmarks of an offensive Native American stereotype. Apache is an interesting case of whitewashing because it is sympathetic to Native Americans, but the film purposefully casted white actors as it would lead to achieve the sympathy from the audience. 1961, Breakfast at Tiffany's, directed by Blake Edwards, screenplay by George Axelrod. Making its debut in movie theaters 16 years after World War II, Breakfast at Tiffany's is notorious for its secondary character, Mr. Yuniyoshi. The buck two fastest landlord exists as a clown to be laughed at by white America. He is hostile and undignified, shouting in broken English, stumbling around and glaring at everyone through slanted eyes. A representative of yellow peril feared of post Pearl Harbor, Mickey Rooney's role is that of a caricature, introduced explicitly in the opening credits as a white actor in costume, so that the audience knows it is not meant to empathize, but to laugh. Mr. Yuniyoshi is perhaps the best known example of yellowface in American cinematic history. The disappearance of similar characters after Tiffany's illustrates whitewashing's history of mischaracterization and how changes in public sentiment affect casting in films. 1965, Othello, directed by Stuart Burge, based on the play by William Shakespeare. Since its inception, the titular character Othello has been played by a white actor. That was the excuse of filmmakers in Britain in 1965 when they cast Lawrence Oliver in blackface as the lead. Highly controversial at the time, it would be the last instance of a white actor in the title role. The civil rights movement was happening simultaneously in America and Britain, and reviews for the film were so poor that it was only screened in movie houses for two days. Oliver put on an effect, deepened his voice, and changed his walk, all to appear blacker. His interviews about his makeup routine during filming also display an obsessive studiousness to achieve the perfect color. Bosley Crawford, writing for the New York Times, called Oliver's performance minstrel-like and went so far as to compare it to The Jazz Singer. Unbelievably, the film received the highest ever number of Academy Award nominations for a Shakespeare film. 1983, Scarface, directed by Brian De Palma, screenplay by Oliver Stone. A cult classic, Scarface is the favorite movie of at least one person you know, but on the surface it appeared to many as just another Italian mob movie. In actuality, Scarface was that dime a dozen Italian mob movie until it was updated in De Palma's outshiningly famous reboot that sought to modernize an American crime story with a Cuban-American cast of characters. The cast of actors, however, was overwhelmingly white. In this way, Scarface only uses Miami and Cubans as a backdrop, with no consideration of what the film's Cuban representation would do to Florida and the reputation of Cuban Americans. A disclaimer at the end of Scarface reads, The vast majority of Cuban Americans have demonstrated a dedication, vitality, and enterprise that has enriched the American scene. This is meant to discourage viewers from framing their understanding of Cuban Americans and Miami around what they see in the film, but many Cubans today are still offended by Pacino's heavy accent and their inextricable affiliation with drugs. 2015 Stonewall, directed by Roland Emmerich, screenplay by John Robin Bates. The true events of the Stonewall riots are lost in the chaos of the moment and the passing of time. More than that, the faces of the movement have been distorted by the white LGBT majority. Those we now know were there and continue to be activists in their community are Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Craig Rodwell, and Storm De La Verie. The main character of the movie, Stonewall, is Danny a fictional white gay protagonist played by straight white actor Jeremy Irvin. This character was created as an easy in for a straight audience, because as the director explains, Danny's very straight acting and therefore should make him easier to empathize with. What transpired surrounding the movie's release was that LGBT audiences who knew their history were disappointed, and the straight audience or those that came in knowing nothing about the Stonewall Rides 
left the theater with a distorted understanding of history and a lukewarm reception of a typical coming-of-age story. Marsha P. Johnson appears less than a minute as a comic relief character, and credit for starting the Stonewall Riots is given to Danny. Stephen Holden, writing for the New York Times, called the film's invention of a generic white knight who prompted the riots tantamount to stealing history from the people who made it. 2017, Ghost in the Shell, directed by Rupert Sanders, screenplay by Jamie Moss, William Wheeler, and Evren Kruger, based on the manga by Masamune Shiro. First serialized as a manga in 1989, Ghost in the Shell is a long-running series with a devoted fan base at home and abroad. A live-action, American film adaptation was an exciting prospect for a property about a world in which human consciousness can exist inside robotic bodies making ethnicity or race irrelevant. Instead of a diverse cast of imaginative characters, however, the film stars white heroes and a white villain. Pavan Sham Dasani of Asian Times wrote, The original is about as Asian as things get. Japanese cult manga, groundbreaking anime, Hong Kong-inspired locations, Eastern philosophy-based story, most of that's been downright ignored with its big screen adaptation, and Scarlett Johansson's casting as the dark-haired, obviously originally Asian lead set netizens into a rage. Mamoru Ushii, Japanese director of the original animated film, defended the casting, as well as other Japanese locals who were interviewed about their opinions on the white cast. What makes this film an interesting case of whitewashing is the clarity it brings to the problem. The casting isn't a problem in Japan, home country of the intellectual property, but in America. Clearly, this is because America is a multicultural, multi-ethnic country with actors of any race and when the opportunity came to cast accordingly, white actors were chosen instead. Japanese-American actress Atsuko Okatsuka had this to say. Hanka Robotics, the corporation in the film, is making a being that's the best of humanity and the best of robotics. For some reason, the best stuff they make happens to be white. White directors, screenwriters, and actors have been telling most of the stories in American cinema for a century. White actors have been cast in whitewashed roles, either under the justification that audiences empathize better with white actors, or out of a belief that white actors are simply the better actors. Dangerous, denigrating, and dehumanizing stereotypes about people of color are spread in movies made by people who don't understand them. Cultures are misrepresented or treated as mere set dressing. Audiences come away with false impressions of minority groups, or even worse, may not see the problem with whitewashing at all. An increase in non-white actors, directors, and screenwriters in mainstream Hollywood has led to more diverse stories with better representation, and the reception has been encouraging. Calling out whitewashing as it occurs is helping to change the American film industry into something better and, in turn, reshape audience perceptions of previously under or misrepresented groups.